Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. I'm your host, Roger Connect, President of Universal Accounting Center. This is a podcast dedicated to helping individuals that are owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses build their firms. It's intended to actually give you the various strategies that you can do to be the best leader you need to be. Hire the great staff, train them, focus on marketing, selling strategies to actually build the firm that you would like to offer in quality accounting services. Each and every week, we bring on here guests, episodes with experts sharing their insights as to what it is we can be doing to work on our businesses. And today's going to be a wonderful experience. This is a guest we've had on before, and I'm excited to have him back. It's John Briggs. John, thank you for being here. Now, you happen to actually be the founder of Insight Tax. You've obviously started an amazing company, lots of successes there. You've written a book for micro gyms, Profit First for Micro Gyms specifically. Uh, we've run around in some circles together, Profit First as a community, but you've recently written a new book, 3.3, right? That's right. So we've got a lot to discuss. I'm going to just kind of start with a backup here of what brought you to the accounting profession? Why tax? Just to give my listeners a little bit of a background as to what got you into the profession. When I first went to college, I wanted to play video games for a living. Oh, there you go. Right. And so I took a bunch of classes with the major computer science is the closest to playing video games. Weirdly enough, after an entire year of classes, not once did a professor assign video game playing as a homework assignment. <laughs> okay. So I thought like, maybe this isn't for me. So I kind of went back to the drawing board and I had a mentor at that time. He, he had knew, known me for a while. I'd worked in a leadership position with his organization. And he's like, you know, press something business related or law seems like that would fit my personality and my skill set. It, it turns out that both of those paths at BYU required me to take an accounting class. Good. First time in my life a subject clicked. I am one of those weirdos. It's just like debits, credits. Wow, I don't understand why I get this. But everything else, biology, physical science, all the other topics, memorizing history, events, big struggle for me. But accounting clicked. And uh, so I went with it and passed what they call the filter class Yep. and uh, still enjoyed it. And then I got into the tax side. I'm like, holy cow, this is like a game. This is fun. Uh, a lot of tax rules. Strategies. And, yeah. You could put it here or put it there and what's the outcome. So it just, it really fit the competitive nature of my personality. Plus it, I just, it, it clicked. So why then start a business? I mean, there's, those are two yeah. different tracks. I mean, obviously, you know, doing the job, being in accounting, but then going out and being an entrepreneur, two different ideas. Yeah, not only are two different tracks, most universities teach you as an accounting student how to be the employee in the cog yes. of the industry. And I'm sure we'll get into it. I have feelings about the industry. So why did I do it? Honestly, I was in a situation in my life that the job I did have wasn't actually paying me anything. Showed up for work every day, did work, but the company was very poorly run. And uh, so I went months without getting a paycheck. Oh, no. And at that point, it was kind of like, man, I'm actually unemployed, but this is worse. Because every day I come into work and I'm doing someone else's job or letting them make money and they're not sharing that with me, being unemployed would actually be better because then I'd at least have free time instead of spending it doing stuff for this guy. Yeah. And so I came home one day and I said to my wife, Kara, I said, you know, I think I just, I think I need to start my own firm. And she's like, oh, finally, will you stop being a grump now? You know, because apparently I was pretty miserable and I didn't realize how bad it was affecting me. So I started my business out of need to put food on my table for my family. And then my inability to say no and wanting to help everybody kind of led to it growing. And a lot of stuff happened between just me and now we're up to like 180 employees. You know, I actually recall similar situations with my own wife. I was in a miserable situation in two different employers and both situations, I went to my wife and finally said, I'm changing employment. And in each case, she said about time. I knew this was coming a year ago. And I'm like, what? what? She just, I was too loyal I was too committed. I was I was wanting to see it through. And because of that, she was just patient enough to say, okay, finally, you'll come to that, that same idea, that conclusion that I've come to. So she was ahead of me. She was supportive yeah. and at the same time encouraging. So I get But that. also patient because then like, I don't know if this is probably in the case for you, but I'm super stubborn, apparently. It's like, even if she wanted to tell me like, you're miserable. Do you not see you're miserable? I'd be like, I'm not miserable. And yeah, 
So they patiently just watch us suffer because yes. we're so stinking stubborn. Well, we've got to learn our lessons. <laughs> which, you know, I, I respect that. All right. So you start your business offering tax services. Is it specifically Insight Tax at the time? Uh, we start, yeah, Insight Tax. Mm -hmm. All right. So Insight Tax, you start, you've done phenomenally well with that. You've grown it tremendously. What are the services that you offer there just so that listeners understand what it is you're doing at that core business level? Tax compliance, tax consulting, cash flow management using a profit uh, system called Profit First, bookkeeping, and the bookkeeping, we have a few, a handful of clients that are outsourced CFO services, but mm -hmm. Honestly, those of you who are accountants, you understand the difference, but it's really more outsourced controller work. We're not really giving them guidance on loans and things like that. We're just helping them understand their financials. And then uh, we do some payroll. We do limited payroll. We don't want to take on live payroll clients, but we do some other like minor payroll stuff. Yeah, interesting. Now, with the growth of the business, you've clearly had to evolve with the company, take on different leadership roles, be a different owner, entrepreneur. In that evolution, you see yourself now in what capacity? What, what do you? What would you say your defining day-to-day -day responsibilities are as it relates to the business? For answer that, everyone listening, if you are the owner of a growing accounting company, accept and embrace the idea that you're the most incompetent person in the company. Wow, profound. Because, yeah, like, okay, if I did a million dollars in revenue and the next year if I didn't grow, I know how to run a company that does a million dollars in revenue. Cool but you're growing and now you're 2 million. Now you're 3 million, 5 million. It's like, I've never done this before. Um, so to put it mildly, yeah, having to learn and switch roles, definitely. Today I've, I've finally given up. I held onto it for a long time because I really enjoyed the work, uh, just serving clients. And again, the game with saving them money from the taxes, but I don't have any more personal clients. So it is me managing my leadership team so that they can manage their teams underneath mm -hmm. them. That's my primary role right now. So I would say 90% of my day is focused on like, how do I train someone? How do I help them see it through the problem? How to take accountability, things like that. You know, your statement really resonated with me because I've experienced this over the growth of the company that I run, Universal Accounting, and my various roles in the business. I've been there over 20 years. I started at the beginning in a very, let's say, menial level. I'll use that term. And the reason why I think what you said is profound is because of all the employees I have in the organization, I have a job description, I have standard operating procedures, I have key metrics to determine whether or not they're doing their jobs well, I have a training program to ensure that they're successful, I've got management to support them. So who in the organization is the least managed, the one that has the most open kind of skill sets and opportunities? And it's me, I'm the one that's trying to blaze the trail break new ground, figure it out. And in a leadership role, everyone's looking to see where I'm going to take the company. I'm the one at the forefront. I'm the one that's like waking up in the morning going, crap, what can I do differently, differently today than I've done before because the company needs to evolve and change? Yeah. And oftentimes we don't even give ourselves an actual job description, right? We're just like, look, it reads, make it happen, good or bad, it's your fault. Like, great, that's my job description. There you go. Every day you show up, it's like, I don't know what's going to face me today. You know, I had a, a conversation with a person that ran a billion-dollar company. Actually, it was a multi-billion-dollar company. And it was in a small setting, had a, uh, an opportunity to ask some Q&A, asked him a question, and I was asking regarding the evolution of the business and his role. And he said something profound in his answer, which was about every 6 to 12 months, he changes his responsibility and role in the company. He figures out what needs to happen in the business, figures out the tasks associated with that, and then delegates it. And so that next 12 months or so is him figuring out what the next role in the organization is. I thought it was profound that literally every six to 12 months, he's firing himself and giving himself a new responsibility. And it sounds you know appealing, how liberating, how fun. The stress is associated with that, that you've got to figure out how do I take this into the unknown and do something that we've not done before that's exhilarating to me, but for some people, it's it's really paralyzing. Any thoughts? It, yeah, that's, I was going to, crippling was the word I had in my head. Um, some people just aren't built to have an, a business like that. And you know what? That's okay. Um, that worked for that billionaire or multi-billionaire company. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be that way. I think you can create your company in a way where the level of change you're comfortable with, you can grow at that pace. Of course. Right? And and sometimes you're accepting that I'm just going to grow at a slower pace, which isn't necessarily bad. Um, I'm sure all your listeners and myself, we've seen clients grow themselves out of business because they grew too fast. 
and didn't have the systems in place, didn't know how to manage things. So I, I think there's other ways to manage it because I, for me, the exhilarating part, yeah, I'm more on the, oh, it's a little crippling, which is why I purposely have solved for that weakness in my firm by hiring other people on my leadership team that like the exhilaration. And then we can talk to each other and and collaborate. Yeah, very good. Now, one thing I'd say with the listeners in mind, none of this is to suggest you have to be growing a specific way or to sit in a certain cadence. This is your business. Every business has its own rhythm and it needs to be a fluid rhythm with positive cash flow. I mean, there's no reason that we need to make this more stressful than it already is. And so if somebody wants to, at the point of let's say, getting to a million-dollar accounting firm, a $5 million accounting firm, say a $500,000 accounting firm, if that's what they intended to build from the get-go and they're there, they've arrived, congratulations. There's nothing saying you have to do it a specific way. This is your company. So admittedly, in the end, take it where you feel it needs to go. Yeah, and I love that. I think today with social media, uh, it's just so tempting to fall into the sexiness of be bigger, grow faster, hustle culture, all that stuff. When really, let's just be comfortable with where we are. If you have a $500,000 practice, congratulations. You're in the top 5% of all human beings on the planet. Like celebrate that. Don't feel bad that someone else, you know, has a $2 million firm. When I explain to some of my colleagues who are accountants, what I'm dealing with, they're like, I wouldn't want that in a million years. Yeah, It's like, I get it. There's days I show up. I don't want that. (laughs) Right. And so, um, yeah, I think people just be comfortable with where you want to set out, set the goal, hit it and then evaluate. Are you comfortable? Then be comfortable and just enjoy life, work a little bit less and spend more time on other things, have a better work life harmony instead of just falling for the lure and the constant barrage that we get of like grow faster, hustle better. You're worthless if you're not dying while you're working, you know? Yep. Yeah. These aren't badges of honor that we can show. No. All right. So that is that actually leads me to a great transition here because you spoke of working and living. You spoke of working less, getting more done. I mean, there's a lot to be said about that because we're all trying to be strategic. We're trying to be productive. And there's a whole thing about efficiency. We would like to think that we're working on what needs to be done and we're doing it efficiently. So you've written a book, 3.3. What was the pre-book experience that caused you to kind of identify those principles, let alone later want to write the book? What were you finding was working that you're like, oh, my heavens, this resonates, this happens? Yeah, so the 3.3 rule, uh, a new workday standard to get more done by working less. You can buy it on Amazon right now if you want. It actually, I didn't want to write it per se. I felt called to write it. Interesting. After finishing Profit First for Micro Gyms, which was the concept of that book is the seed from Mike Michalowicz's concept of Profit First, and I just adapted it to our, we we have a large client base of gym owners. This was all me. And I would say what inspired it started with my first experience in accounting. I was working with Deloitte, and I realized that, man, they're rewarding all of us based on our billable hour which is a whole other separate topic of yeah. the billable hour. But that's how that was set up. Yet, uh, only one or two people in the entire office actually had control over people's workflow. So if someone handed me a one thing to work on, and I only had one thing to work on, I don't want to be not promoted over another guy because I'm more efficient than them and can get through it faster. And I saw this across the board. So what happens is the person then will end up taking a longer time, you know, who, and you know, who suffers in that is the client. Now they're paying higher fees. If I had a bunch of things to work through, I could crank through it, show how valuable I am and how efficient I am. But yeah, promotions, all those things, all based on the bill bar. So I didn't love how it was kind of set up to really hurt the client. Then, oh, by the way, minimum, minimum 55 hours a week. You want to keep your job. You're putting in at least 55 billable hours which not every second of every day is billable. So you're now 65 hours a week. But that's just to keep your job. But I don't want to just keep my job. I want to grow and develop. It's human, like our human desire wants us to keep growing. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now I'm putting in 70, 75 hours. They, and they don't care. They don't care. Why? Because they know the statistics. In three to five years, accountants will leave the industry completely because their soul has been sucked from them through this terrible model. And I wanted to create a firm from day one when I started my own 
that had nothing to do with that. I wanted to be the anti-traditional firm. Um, we're not quite there yet. I still have the aspiration that we can work 40 hours a week during tax season. The last three, we've averaged 42.6 hours a week. We're close. But my team now, they're still there three to five years later. Yeah. They still want to be accountants. They still want to serve their clients. I think what we do as accountants is super important to the economy. It keeps small business owners in business because we know they don't understand their numbers, but they need to if they want to stay in business. So it's like, man, if, if we keep going down this hole and don't fix the traditional model, I think our economy's in for a, a problem because we're going to price ourselves out of small business owners being able to afford us because we can't find people to help us. And because there's going to be so much demand on our services, we're going to have to charge more just to keep us sane. Uh, and so it's a long rant, but that's really where the concept of the 3.3 rule started and just evolved as we continued to try to find ways to keep people living a nice 40 hour a week, even during tax season. So with that context, obviously you felt kind of compelled to write the book because you were on this mission to build a firm that was built on a different principle as it related to providing accounting to tax services. The 3.3 rule is what? What is it? So uh, let me give a little bit of back context because I think I feel like the history is interesting and important. Uh, back in the late 1800s, average work week was 80 to 100 hours. Industrial age, we got to keep machines going, so we need people there. Uh, early 1900s comes along this guy who wants to sell these motorized carriages. Um, you know, people didn't tend to have a desire for those because if you add up 80 to 100 hours of work week, throw in sleep, there's not very much time for anything else. Yes. Okay, well, no one wants to go anywhere. They just go to work and they go home and sleep. Um, how do I get them to want to go places? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give them, instead of just one day off a week, which was the standard at the time, I'm going to give them two days off at the at end of the week. So this guy created the weekend for us. And then he said, but I don't want them going into the weekend having worked 80 hours. I want them with enough energy to want to do something recreational or leisurely. So, you know what? I'm going to cap them at eight hours a day, which became our standard 40-hour work week. And it took probably 20 to 30 years before it became law and there's overtime laws and the Fair Labor Standard Act and all that stuff. But ultimately, Henry Ford created the current 40-hour work week and the weekend as we have it now. Why? Because he wanted to sell more cars. There's no science behind that. He just wanted to sell more cars, but we continue to do that today. Well, luckily, we've had a lot of science that has happened between the early 1900s and now, and we can rely on that science to help us identify there's a more efficient way that our brains are designed to work, and it's not sitting our butt down in a seat for eight hours straight, and it's not necessarily saying work can only happen between Monday and Friday. Um... And so with that context, the 3.3 rule states, the most efficient workday is to work up to three hours at a time, followed by a 30% recovery period. Work up to three hours, follow that with a 30% recovery period. So if I worked an hour, I would take 20 minutes off after that hour. If I worked a full three hours, I would take an hour off. Uh, but that's, that's the rule. And what I like about this rule is it's not too uncommon. If you look at labor laws, typically you work a four-hour period of time and they suggest you take 15 or 30 minutes off. So like with uh, youth, it's every two hours they get 15 minutes off. So there is kind of some semblance in what you're saying, but I'm going to add to it from a school perspective. When we're working with our students, one of the things that we have found from a study intake, you're talking about information overload, is if you can sit down for no less than an hour, but no more than three hours, that's when you're most productive in learning and getting things done, understanding, and not being overwhelmed by the information. And so what we've learned is as we provide instruction to our students is 
To get into the rhythm, you've got to at least commit to one, an hour. Anything less than an hour, you're spending too much time getting set up, getting initiated into it, getting organized, launching into whatever task or project that you have. But if you're ending it within an hour, you've got to then wrap things up and situate yourself so you can kind of have a stopping point. Well, the productive time in that hour isn't an hour. It's more, much less than that. So if you go now as many as three hours, you're very productive. But to go beyond three hours, you start to hit these walls, these burnouts. So I really relate to what you're saying. It resonates with me. I see the value in it. And I would imagine that if you can focus, work hard for that period of time, you can be more, much more productive knowing that there's this three-hour end on the on the horizon. And that's where a lot of benefit we've seen is once people realize they're given permission to take a break. Cause without that permission, what we do is we feel guilty. Like we, whether it's conscious, but most of the time subconscious, we know we can't sit down for eight hours straight and work eight hours. Yeah. Like a lot of times people, the first thing to think about when they sit down and start working is when is my lunch break? I'm can't wait to take that. Um, so we know we can't do that, but I also know that, man, I don't want my boss to look over my shoulder. Or if you're the owner, you're like, my clients need me. I have this, unending, ever-growing to-do list, yep. I can't in good conscience take a break because ev everyone needs me. So we feel guilty without this permission. But by giving the permission, now all of a sudden it's like, not only am I more focused during this time period because I'm not just, it's not on purpose. It's not laziness. It's just, man, if I have to do this whole thing for eight hours, I just do it a little bit slower. I do it a little bit less focused. I let distractions get in the way. I'm going to, oh, what's that notification on my phone? You know, like I'm going to let those things happen. When I know I'm going to get a dedicated break time to do absolutely no work, we have found you're more focused during that work time. And then you go and you take your break and it's completely work free. You come back rejuvenated and you're ready, mentally prepared to have another great focus period, whether that's one hour, two hours, three hours. I'm loving this. So let me ask, then do you have a comment regarding multitasking? Individuals that try to do a lot of things at once during, let's say, these three hours, what would your advice be to them? Yeah, look, there's so much data out there. Multitasking is uh, a farce, as they would say. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the best example I've seen to prove it, if you write out numbers like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you go down and go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Like you write those out, you can do both those pretty fast. Because what you did is you did one task, you switched and did another one. Mm -hmm. If I'm multitasking, the equivalent is 1A, 2B. And if you do that, you'll notice that you're like seven times slower going back and forth than you are just writing it out yes. that way. So if you think you're multitasking, dude, no, you're, you're not. Maybe you're switch tasking really quickly. But that goes back to your point. If... Uh, you found that in an hour period of classes, like there's some unproductive time because people have to warm up to it. It's no different when we switch tasks and studies have shown, depending on the task itself, you could, it could take you anywhere from 30 seconds to like 20 minutes to get back in the groove of that focus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we definitely recommend minimizing switch tasking. Um, and that's why we like the focus blocks. Cause I can just say like, here's an activity I'm doing. And it looks like I only have about an hour of it. That's fine. Do an hour of it, then take 20 minutes off and then come back and do another task. Because you're allowing yourself to take that 30% recovery period between switching tasks, your downtime and getting back up to speed is actually a lot faster because it's not true switch tasking the way the studies do it, where it's like an immediate distraction then pulls me back. It's like you're welcoming the distraction mentally ready to go back and be focused when your break is over. I'm loving this. You're, you're hitting on a lot of very important principles here. So this is good. So let's talk about workaholics. Um, I don't know what the technical term is. It's not like I've got a, a, a definition here, but I would consider myself a workaholic. I love what I do. I am focused on what I do. I don't mind continuing to do it. So the challenge I have is three hours goes by in a flash. For me, it's not when is lunch. It's, oh crap, it's two o'clock and I haven't taken lunch. And you know I'm going to go to a dinner tonight at six. That's four hours away. Do I bother to eat now? <laughs> 
I'm really hungry. I'm going to eat something. I mean, that's the challenge is I'm pushing through things. And so for me, you know, setting an alarm for three hours and, and stopping, that would be an achievement just in and of itself because I, I'm just fine working through it. What advice would you have for someone who's on the other side that work isn't laborious and it's, and it's not, I need an out. It's, I need to pace myself better. Yeah. So there is a difference between enjoying what you're doing and being efficient and productive at what you're doing. Um, the studies would show, and so we could do this with you, Roger, if oh, you here we go. admitting you're a workaholic. <laughs> the studies show that e even if you enjoy doing it and you pushed through in your past three hours, uh -huh. your work productivity and efficient efficiency and even potentially quality of the work after that time period has declined. And so really it has to come to a focus of like, well, what is the purpose of this activity I'm doing? And do I want to give it my best? If so, even as a workaholic, I'm going to be better at working and I'm going to enjoy it more if I allow myself to take these breaks throughout the day, because then, I mean, I had this conversation with the gym owner and, uh, <laughs> It's this, he's the same thing. These guys wake up at like 4 a.m. in the morning. Oh, yeah. And then they yeah. teach classes till like 9 a.m. Yep. <clears throat> and then instead of going to sleep or doing life stuff, they just keep working in their gym. And then usually there's a big, another rush between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. So they have, unfortunately, kind of a natural 18, 15 to 18 hour day built in. He said the same thing. Like, I just love it. I love it. When I'm done with the classes, I want to go on and I think about my, my gym. I want to think about my finances. And I said, look, I mean, he didn't know he was a workaholic. So I had to be the one that dropped that <laughs> nugget on him. I'm like, you're kind of a workaholic. And, you know, if you enjoy finances and looking at those things and looking at pricing and creating new programming, just try it out. Because the problem right at this point is you're addicted to always being doing something, which being busy isn't the same thing as being productive. Mm -hmm. And so enjoy what you do. And I'm not saying like, Maybe you don't need a full 30 minute recovery. I don't know, but the science says you do and give it a, give it a try. Like you're a workaholics focus has to actually be, I have to be intentional about taking a break versus other people who aren't workaholics. They have to be intentional about being focused while they're working. Yeah. And so it's just another, it's the other side of the coin, but I think you'll find if you are intentional about taking breaks you will find more enjoyment and even more productivity and higher quality out of the work that you're doing. So my listeners would know this. I bring up that I'm a workaholic regularly. Uh, it's something that I, I know and, and I'm aware of, but uh, at this point I haven't been able to address. And so I'm liking this conversation because partly it is permission. Uh, I'm very focused and driven, and because I don't give myself permission to slow down, I don't take these leisurely type things. But at the same time, it's like, what would I do? What would what? I'm going to now get on Instagram or TikTok and just you know, <laughs> well, I wasted 30 minutes on yeah. that. That was fun. That was leisure. I enjoyed that. Wasn't that uh, you know exhilarating? Let's go back to work now. I don't know what I would do for those 30 minutes. Right. So what I've tried to incorporate is okay. I think I'm going to do some exercise. I think that I there's some books. I if you looked at the stack of books that I have that I'm, you know, wanting to read, I could actually find time, 30 minute chunks or whatever to read through these books. So I'm trying to identify what are productive things that I can do mm -hmm. that currently I don't provide or afford myself the opportunity to do. That would be good use of those breaks. And yep. I think it would actually mentally allow me to get back in and be focused and hopefully be more productive like you were describing earlier. So Yeah, and so taking breaks, definitely a critical part of the 3.3 rule because um, you can do it wrong. And so we have a chapter on that in the book. Like bad things to do during a break are what you just said. <laughs> Instagram, TikTok, <laughs> social media, anything that's spiking dopamine is not a good break activity. Interesting. Um, because what happens is you're not giving your brain the actual recovery period it needs. You're actually overstimulating it beyond what your work stimulates. Those things are designed after the same studies that showed how uh, you can get people addicted to a behavior, the same studies that casinos use to keep people oh, yeah. gambling. Yeah. It's literally the same studies and science that casinos use to take all your money that social media is using to take all your time. Yeah. So no, those aren't good. Um, while I do enjoy doing this, apparently eating junk food is not a good thing to do Darn during it. your break. Um, so snack time every 30 minutes, every three hours isn't good either. Dang no, it. yeah. 
Um, unless it's healthy food, I guess. Break but, out the celery. Yeah. So anything that's going to stimulate your brain. And even with when I first introduced this to my firm, uh, you know, they thought I did tax returns for three hours. I'm not going to check email on my break. Not that's not a break. <laughs> that's still you're, you switch tasks to another work function. Um, so don't do that. But a lot of times think creative things, um, especially for those of us who are accountants who maybe aren't necessarily creative minded. Mm -hmm. Although I do argue with that. I think those of us who play with the tax code, we are very creative and it's awesome. But um, creative things like drawing, even coloring, if it's, even though it sounds childish, like if you enjoy that, then do it. Color, painting, journaling, uh, for sure exercise is a great thing. Um, I'm sure there's not a lot of ton of gym owners that listen to this, but it is a little bit different if uh, working out is your job. But for all of us who are accountants, exercise is great. Um, one of my favorite activities to do during my break is to lay down on my floor and take a 10-minute nap. Perfectly great thing okay. to do. So with a nap, do you set the alarm or do you just naturally wake up? Um, I have over the you know 20 years I've been doing this, I naturally wake up between 10 and 12 minutes. Interesting. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've taken a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've taken a nap, but it's been a long time yeah. since I've taken a nap. All right. So another thing I'd like to understand about this is when someone has a culture, because you've been talking about your employees, your staff, and so forth, when you have a culture, you're you're trying to help them learn these best practices. And where I'm finding this kind of come to play is, first of all, I'm old enough that I was from a work environment that was very, very driven. And people that kind of socialized and walked around the office and chit-chatted, I would consider that frowned upon in the work cultures that I was involved in, but now I see the value of it. Not that I understood it then or did it, it's, I, I see the value in that. Well, when you have so many remote workers, there's a wonder of, at least a paranoia from being the president of the company, is everyone actually working? They're all at home. Are they really working? So when you go to them and you're saying, oh, no, take a break to do this, whatever, there's this concern that you're going to you're going to just kind of liberate them to not do anything at all. So I really do feel that, you know, key performance metrics and, and production metrics are ex essential. But what's where I'm going with this is it's funny to me how much more relaxed I am today than I was maybe two, three years ago, that when I call an employee and I can clearly tell that they're in a vehicle or in a public setting, it doesn't bother me anymore. They're able to take my call, address whatever business need I have. They're hitting the metrics. They're getting the job done. But this particular time I'm calling them in the day, the fact that they're running an errand, they're in their car, picking up their kid, it no longer bothers me. Where three years ago, I'd be like, what the heck? I just called. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. Why are you not at the office? Why are you not home? I should hear a radio in the background, not cars and tires and everything. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think... Um, we, we, what we need to do as a society, which sounds like you've made this shift naturally, is we need to move from this idea of your butt is in the seat between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. or 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., whatever, right? Versus what results are you getting? Yes. Um, at the end of the day, as a company, as the owner, when you're paying a team member, there has to be a return on what you're paying that person. The only way to know if there's a return is to have a scoreboard. Yes. Like, so metrics, like you said, are super essential. And if someone is hitting the results, then why not give them that flexibility? Everybody polled loves the flexibility from like when COVID happened and I can work from home, like everyone's work satisfaction shot through the roof uh, because now I have this flexibility and maybe I don't have to be sitting down at 10 o'clock. Maybe I just I've been working for a little bit. I just want to get up and go out and walk or wh whatever it may be. Um, so I, I'm with you. I, there's still moments, there's certain scenarios that I even struggle with that still. It's like, wait, what are you doing? What? <sighs> um, but it, the more results driven you can be, I think in the long run, it makes sense. So we actually try to structure some of our team members, their compensation in a way to match that. It's like, look, it's fine. Have complete, flexibility on your time when you work, when you don't work, but you're going to be paid based on your results. Yeah. 100%. And I'm going to take this to two levels. One, I do still have a guilt myself when during the work day, I'm not in the office working. 
if I go to Home Depot, or if, if you know, I, I do something that is personal, like the other day I had to go to the bank and check on my uh, HSA loan. That was personal, right? So it was it was kind of interesting in the sense that I was still like, I, sh- I should be working right now, but I'm very productive. So I, I'll, I need to cut myself some slack. But at the same time, as it relates to employees, when they come to me and they say, I've been working a lot or so many hours, I'm less tolerant of that now. Because before I might have been accepting of, you've been in the office, I've seen you here, I saw you come and I saw you go, I know you put in a full day. I can see you're working hard. I'm actually a little less tolerant of it in the fact that now I have very clear key metrics, expectations, and I'm, in many instances, very indifferent to how much time it's taking you. Just get the job done. Because I do feel that there are latitudes being taken when working from home. And those latitudes, doing the laundry, helping with the kids, those are natural. And if I'm going to accept that, I need to then expect the work week. What are your thoughts regarding that that, uh, uh, tolerance or acceptance? I mean, when when you're talking about remote work, like the first thing that comes to mind is in my book, I tried to f- like find a bunch of studies. I wanted to find definitive proof mm-hmm. uh, if it's good or bad. And you know what? It doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, I found things as far as like working from home is the thing closest to heaven. And the other one is like, this is the spawn of Satan, right? Like, I think we need to accept that it depends on people. So go to go to your question... I think it depends. Like if people are getting a result, then I don't have a problem with flexibility. Yes. But if they're not getting a result and then they start asking for special treatment outside of the normal standard operating procedures or things we've agreed on, then it does bother me too. It's like, dude, you're not even getting results. And so if you're not getting results, yes, it's my job as the owner to like, let's figure out why you're not doing that. But sometimes the answer is you're just not the right fit. Yep. Um, so I think it's totally fine to, to have both ways. I think it's okay with some team members, you trust them because they've earned that trust and other team members, you don't trust them. One's getting the job done. The other one's not getting the job done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, related to this, just at a remote worker uh, topic, I'm, I'm fascinated by the number of conversations I have regarding culture, how it's evolved over the last number of years. In my particular case, I had everyone in the office, uh, for, 35, 30 years, Universal Accounting was a single office location. Everybody worked in the office. We started about 10 years ago, long before COVID, uh, experimenting with remote workers and so forth. And I would dare say at least two or three years before COVID, most of my employees worked out of the office. So it wasn't a surprise when that whole thing occurred. But the point is, is now most of my employees are entirely remote. They're out of state. And so the cultural dynamic of, I I at least used to see the employees on a regular basis. I got to interact with them, socialize with them, know them a little bit on a personal level. I dare say I have most of my employees now where they're remote workers. I've never met them. I've spoken with them a handful of times. I don't know anything about them personally. And so it's an interesting thing where you're trying to create a culture in the office. You're trying to create loyalty. You're trying to help them feel like they're contributing and they're part of something big, that they're actually uh, working with purpose and intent. That's a challenge as a leader I'm having to deal with as I'm hoping that they feel like they're valued and contributing. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So actually in the book, I have a chapter where I go through, here are the systems and like, here are the systems that every business has. Sales, marketing, delivery, operations, right? Mm -hmm. And I throw in one and I call it uh, your system of caring, or in other words, your culture. I think too often businesses approach culture haphazardly. And so whatever happens, happens instead of the leader being super uh, what's the word, like directive and visionary of this is where I want to guide the culture of my company. In order to do that, you need systems around it. Um, Because you have a culture in your organization. I don't know what that is, but it exists. Mm-hmm. It it all, all always happens, right? Yep, yep. And so even if you don't know your team, again, you have culture. Uh, for us, we've also ran into this from our need, uh, there's a shortage of accountants, right? And and you want to find good accountants. And, you know, going from one person to 180, we've hired a lot of people. Well, 
in order to find good people, we had to start reaching out outside of our local geographical area. Because mm -hmm. I do, I loved, I mean, I love working with the people in the office. It's so much easier to create the culture that I want with people physically there. Um, but in order to find all the, like the volume of accountants that we need to handle the growth and the clients and the way I want to change the industry, we've had to reach out uh, to remote people. And so now we have easily 40 to 50 remote team members. Um, but we're very conscious about our system of the culture. Now they don't get the full experience because they're remote, but that's the trade-off because for them, our culture is a little bit different than the culture of a team member who works in the office because they experience the stuff I want them to experience, but then they have an experience of like more flexibility than someone who's working out of the office. Yeah. Uh, and so we just, we had to be conscious and purposeful about some of those things that we wanted to keep doing, even though people are remote. Yep. I love this. This is a great conversation. All right. Here's where I'd like to go. And this is something I'm sure my listeners would appreciate understanding. You've grown to the point now and you're experiencing a lot of this demand that you were alluding to that the profession's going to experience as we have so many accountants retiring. The CPAs, EAs, they're all retiring at, the, at a pace faster than those entering the profession, right? So we're experiencing the small business community growing. We're seeing the economy expand. The business needs are are basically falling now onto the accounting profession with fewer professionals, less time to do the work. All that being said, you've got this backlog of tax returns being done. And you've come up with a system that enable people to maybe come in and actually help out, take on, and in a 1099 capacity, just go to work. Tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, it there's a lot of people start their business because they saw the same stuff I saw. But in, I appreciate that instead of saying, I'm just leaving the industry completely, I'm going to go work for a Fortune 100 company. I'm going to still do this. I'm just going to do it on my own and not have to deal with this garbage of like working myself to death. But then they get into it. And because this is how it is, and this is the path everyone follows, they end up following into the trap of, I look how many hours I'm working. I didn't want to work. I didn't think I'd have to work this many hours. Yeah. So what we realized is a lot of those people at the end of the day realize they love serving the client, but they really don't enjoy, I dare say hate, the back end part of business. They didn't realize that to have a firm wasn't just doing tax work. Like, is this the right invoicing system? Did the client pay? Do I have to follow up with the client? Is this the right process? Is this the most efficient way to get the tax work done? Is this the best tax software? Like, right, all the questions that we have. And so what I wanted to do is say, we're good at that. And, and we're also really good at uh, finding clients for people. Now, in today's day and age, when we first started the model, it was very appealing to say, look, Come join our organization. You have complete flexibility. You're actually even still your own entity, but you'll operate under our brand and we're going to fill your book of business for you. That was enough. People were like, wow, that's great. I'm yeah. not very good at marketing. I hate networking. Yeah. You just hand me paying clients. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Well, now a lot of people are because of uh, COVID forced a lot of people to retire early. And if, again, our, uh, we're still losing accountants three to five years in, but enrollment in, in universities are down across the country. So there's a massive shortage. So now it's like, I don't have a problem getting clients. Okay, well, are they paying you what you're worth? You know, when it's just you on an island, it's very easy for you to give in to that sad story and discount the value you're offering. And I'm not saying don't be kind and polite and generous, Yeah. but your company isn't a charity. You want to be charitable, do that in a different avenue. And you need a profitable business to even be charitable. Yeah. So then I say, okay, there's still that. Maybe you can fill your book with clients, but are they paying you the right amount and what you're worth? Second of all, okay, great. We've answered all those questions for you. We're doing industry best practice. We have systems in place that we have a whole team that gathers the documents for clients. We have another team of entry-level accountants who are striving to learn. They're doing data prep. And then those get peer-reviewed. And so by the time the and what we call them licensees, the accountant who's signing the return sees it, it's already been viewed by two different people. And now they're the ones having the conversation with the client. The relationship lives with the, between the client and this professional. And we're saying, let us take that headache off your plate. All you got to do is focus on serving the client. 
and it's worked out great. I mean, we have more than 10 now. Uh, we've had some for almost 10 years. These guys make way more money than the average partner does in accounting firms mm -hmm. and working 42.6 hours a week during tax season. There you go. I love it. You know, what you're doing is, I think, amazing. It needs to happen. I think the profession has too many stigmas against it. And uh, what we need to do is reinvent what this actually is. And I think this is the perfect time to reinvent the accounting profession, literally from how we interact with our clients to being more forward thinking in the advisory work that we're doing, to be more strategic and advisory in the taxes that we actually help people with. This is a chance to now change the workflow, the client relations, all these things need to evolve. The old green visor, the armband, the, the abacus, we're done with this stuff. Let's get it behind us. We've got now the systems, the tools, the resources. A lot of the things can be said about how we've liberated our time with the use of AI and these different plugins. So what do we do now? We take on more clients, perhaps, but also can't we just change the interaction we have with the clients and how they experience the accounting services we offer? So I'm loving what you're doing. And it benefits the accounting professional. It's not just all client facing, it's the accounting professional. So well done. This is good. So what was a question you thought I would ask that I didn't ask? Uh, you know, I actually come into these things, I've done so many that I don't ever have expectations. All right. <laughs> Well, that's perfectly fine. Sometimes I bring people in and they're like, I thought you were going to ask this. I'm like, no, mm, well, it wasn't on my agenda. We had a great conversation yeah. otherwise. So on a personal note, you've done phenomenally well. Your family has seen the work, the struggles, the challenges you faced as you've built these this wonderful business. How do you feel your family is benefiting from what they're experiencing with you? Well, I mean, I can tell you this. Uh when I first started my career and I was still figuring this out after I realized, look, I don't like the Deloitte model. I don't necessarily have it figured out, but you know, I did my own thing and this is how it is. Broke my heart. The first couple tax seasons when my wife would say, you know, I'm basically a single parent during tax season. It's like, Oh, that hurts because yeah. we didn't go into that agreement of let's be married. Let's support each other. Let's have kids and bring them into the world together and raise them. And, Oh, by the way, half the year, you're going to have to do it on, on your own. Yeah. So um, they benefit that I'm at home every night for dinner. I mean, most nights for dinner, right? It's, it's not perfect, but certainly more than a lot of accountants, especially during tax season. So they can expect that. And again, there's enough data that shows your kids are better off if you have family dinner together. Um, they, they have an opportunity when they see that I'm stressed, like we talk through stuff. Uh, they like business things. We watch Shark Tank together. I can help answer the questions. And like, so it's fun and interesting to see them learn some entrepreneurial stuff that obviously they're not getting in the public school system. Um, but I would say the biggest benefit is that I am a help meet for my wife. I'm, I'm supportive uh, because I can physically be there and be supportive. Uh, and that's, that's made all the difference with the model that we try to put out into the world. I love it. I love it. Well, on that note, I'm going to wrap this up then. I think this is great. So there's a few things that I'd like to point out to the listeners. In the episode description, there's going to be some things that you can take advantage of. One, clearly getting a copy of the book 3.3. I would encourage you to do so. Excellent information in there as to how we can work more efficiently, work harder and less time and get more done. And with that, I think be more productive. So obviously get a copy of the book. Also in the episode description, there's going to be some information regarding this opportunity with Insight Tax, how you can basically take the skills, the talents, the experience you have, put them to work, but not have to deal with a lot of the, ex the outside influences and strains that exist for individuals that are operating successful tax businesses. Just go to work and get paid what you're worth. Now, with all that information, let me just do a quick summary of our conversation. I just thought this was wonderful. First of all, the idea of growing the business. I remember when we were starting at the beginning talking about growing and expanding the business, but accepting the fact that every business owner really needs to look at their own goals, their own needs, and build a company that they want, whether it's a $500,000 business, a $5 million business, $50 million. We as leaders need to understand where we're going and not be comparing ourselves necessarily to everyone else. But being a leader, we need to also understand that it's lonely at the top. I liked where we were talking about this fact that of all the individuals in the organization, the one that has the most, let's say, unclear job description is the president of the company as they're leading and forging new roads and headways for the company. That's fascinating. I think that's an, an insight that I really didn't appreciate until that that epiphany and that part of the conversation. The other thing I really appreciate 
appreciated was here towards the end as we were talking about the accounting profession is recognizing that this is the chance for us as accounting professionals to really change what's happening as it relates to our work week, our workflow, and also the client relations that we're having. How revolutionary this is. And I'm hoping in this episode, you kind of got inspired to realize, you know what, maybe now's the time to really take the bull by its horns and kind of change what you're doing with your clients, setting the expectations, managing those, and at the same time, taking a proactive approach to your business as it relates to perhaps the tax season, the work week, and what it is that you can actually do to afford your employees, basically that work-life balance that they're looking for. I hate the word balance, but I'm going to throw it in there for any case. Uh, The other thing I'd like to point out is your last comment regarding being there at the family. You know, no success outside of the home can compensate for failure in the home. And I really do believe that. I'm glad that you were able to identify that you're being home for your family. Raising the children is where you want to be. And I do believe that society is a reflection of the family. If we're messed up at home, it's going to show up in the, in the, you know, community. So that's really good that that's a priority for you. And I appreciate hearing that. So that's what I wanted to share. Do you have a final thought that you'd like to end with? I would just say this accountants, like we are more valuable to the world than you give yourself credit for. And I hope everybody's taking action and making decisions that allows you to continue your journey as an accountant, as opposed to following the typical path that we hear and see about that is going to eventually lead to burnout. Uh, let's let let's not burn out your candle. Let's keep it glowing. Uh, don't put it under a bushel. You right. Put it on top of a hill. Yeah. So that you can keep saving your small business clients and keep them in business because that's what ultimately we need. Beautiful. Wonderfully said. You know, to my listeners, here's what I'd like to end with. Obviously, if you haven't already subscribed, definitely do so. This is a podcast committed to your success as you're working to build your business. So definitely subscribe, set those notifications so that each and every week you can hear these various episodes where we bring on the experts and discuss topics that you need to consider as you're running your business. In addition to subscribing to the podcast, I also want to invite you to GrowCon. This is an annual conference for owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. It's where you need to be so that you can actually hear from the experts off of the stage. And at the same time, meet with your peers, interact with those individuals that are doing just like you, collaborate, figure out what you can be doing better to grow your business. And then lastly, meet with the team from Universal Accounting Center, those individuals that are committed to help you be in business for yourself, but not by yourself with Universal Accounting. The other thing I'd like to point out is we do have a variety of free resources available to you at universalaccounting.com. Go check out those various resources that are intended to help you, whether they're white papers, eBooks, courses, these are all enabling you to actually work on your business. And then in addition to that, we have some podcast related information, some playlists that are highlights of various conversations I've had over the years. These are playlists that you can binge listen to that are related to marketing, selling, pricing, onboarding, tech stacks, just a variety of topics that I'm sure you'll find relevant particular to your situation and needs. And then lastly, if you have any questions about what it is we can do at Universal Accounting to help you with your needs as it relates to training your staff and so forth, reach out to us. You can go to universalaccountingschool.com or you can give us a phone call at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care, be safe, and then have a great day. 